basically. I mean, one of them is just Marxist. You know, it's like, what are power structures there for? Well, they're there to serve the purposes of the elite. It's like, no, that's one of their purposes. You know, and I, that monomania, that, that, that insane desire for singular causes, to me, that's also the expression of an archetype. It's monotheism in action. It's like, you know, so you see these people who, who, who claim to be atheistic, they just invent a new god. Foucault did that with power. Freud did that with sex. You know, if you're smart too, you can take a major motivational drive or system. They're not really drives. They're really personalities. You can take a major motivational personality like power or sex and you can explain everything on its basis because everything is, every human action is motivated by the major motivational system, some admixture of them. And then if you're smart enough, you can always figure out a way that some complex phenomena is related causally to some simpler motivation. But it's intellectual masturbation, as far as I'm concerned. It's not the attempt to explain something. It's the attempt to reduce everything to one simple principle that you can be master of. Now, so that's so, you know, was religion for crowd control? Well, it's just a, that's an empty theory. Well. What, so this is what, a multi-generational uh, conspiracy, that's what it is. It's, it's a conspiracy that stretches as far back into the past as we can imagine, right back to where people were tribal, and maybe farther back than that. I mean, that's not an explanation. And the, the other one, the uh, supernatural explanation, well, you know, there are, there, are, there are people who think they think scientifically, but they don't, because they're not very good at it. And then there are people who think scientifically at a genius level. It's like, well, there are people who think they think religiously, but don't. And then there are people who think religiously at a genius level. And you can't assume that you can use the same motivational explanation at every single level of analysis. So, yes, there are elements of religious belief that are superstitious. Although, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a sleight of hand too, because if you want to argue that religious, religion is only superstition, you collect up all the superstitions, you define them as religious, and then you define religion as a collection of superstitions. So, you know, it's, it's not very careful articulation of the whole class of phenomena that are attempting to be, that, 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 that people are attempting to explain. And there's also a big difference between explaining and explaining away. So, well, Dennett likes to explain away things, like consciousness, you know, and you can't explain away consciousness. Well, you can. It depends on how you structure your initial presumptions about the world. You know, so the logos that we were talking about earlier that's associated with, let's say, articulated truth and the communication of articulated truth, <clears throat> that's basically the prime function of consciousness. And the, the Judeo-Christian story is predicated on the idea that that is a fundamental element of being. Now, you, you, can, you can structure your world with different presuppositions. So you could say, well, consciousness is an epiphenomena of the material world. Well, you can make a perfectly coherent and useful set of tools out of those presuppositions, but that set of tools does not cover everything that you need. And it's no more viable as an explanation than the explanation that no consciousness is somehow fundamental to being. And of course, being is different than material reality. So, and, and these things aren't grappled with properly by positivistic scientists who have no real training in philosophy and who know nothing at all about religion. You know, their religion, the, the Christianity that Dawkins criticizes, is the Christianity that a smart 13-year-old boy objects to. So it's like, well, you know, how can you reconcile Genesis with evolutionary history? It's like, well, no, that's really not the problem. So it's a straw man argument. Hello, ugly, you better sit. <laughs> sit, lay down, lay down. One of the things that I've learned about argumentation is that if you're trying to distinguish between the validity of two different worldviews, you want to make the po strongest possible case for both worldviews. You're not trying to be right. You're trying to figure something out. And the easiest way to be right is to make your opponent into an idiot. So, 
There's no doubt that empirical science has kicked the slats out of the way people think about religion. Because it wasn't easy for people to understand that there could be different... that different systems of thought might have different purposes. You have to be a philosopher of thought to, to think about that even. And I don't think it was... I don't think that became obvious at all until after Nietzsche. Not all belief systems serve the same masters, so to speak. And so, you can't assume that every system of thought is doing the same thing. And then, you can't assume also that there's only one way to formulate the, your basic assumptions about the nature of reality. I mean, Heidegger, I, I didn't discover the, the relationship between the system of thought that I derived, say, from Nietzsche and Jung and some other people that I, I read, and Heidegger until much after I had written Maps of Meaning. But Heidegger's study of being is predicated on the idea that being is the fundamental reality, and that is not objective reality, it's not material reality, it's lived experience, it's something like that. Lived experience is real. Okay, that's a presupposition. So you start with that presupposition, then you ask yourself, well, what are the basic elements of lived reality? And then what happens there, or at least what seems to have happened, is that Heidegger identified the same basic elements of lived reality that I identified in Maps of Meaning. And one was the social world, the world that's constructed by humans, which I think is basically the an elaborated dominance hierarchy. And it's permanent. So this is where the issue about what constitutes reality becomes very critical. Dominance hierarchies are 300 million years old. They're older than trees. So if you think that's what, what one definition of what's real is what's persistent across time, then it's almost impossible to find anything more real about life than a dominance hierarchy. So This goes to your point about lobsters, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. It's the same bloody circuitry, serotonergic circuitry. I mean, there's another cir circuit that lobsters use that we don't have that's based on oct octamine. I think that's the right word. But a lot of the way that lobsters maneuver within dominance hierarchies is the way we maneuver within dominance hierarchies. And if you're an evolutionary thinker, you, you can't just push that away. And dominance hierarchies are, although you can think about them as a social construct, they're also a, a natural phenomena, right? So, the dominance hierarchy is actually a major part of the environment to which we have adapted. Okay, so there's the dominance hierarchy, that's, the, we'll say, the social world for the sake of argument. There's the natural world, and there's the experiencing subject. Well, those are Heidegger's categories of being as well. And in, in some sense, what, what religious thinking seems to do is to continually posit those three things as interacting causally at the base of being. So, and that's not material reality. There's a lot of things about being that we can't attribute simply to material reality. We may eventually be able to do that, but by that time our notion of what constitutes material will be much different. Okay, so we, we can't deal with subjectivity within the confines of our materialist theories. And that's partly because those theories are predicated on the elimination of subjectivity as an a priori move, right? The whole point of objective science is to remove subjectivity. Okay, so then it gets removed and, well, you're surprised about it. It's like, well, no, you can't be surprised about it. You removed it right at the beginning. Now, that works for certain purposes. It works very well. But it has consequences, and some of those consequences, as far as I'm concerned, are serious enough to produce two forms of social and mental illness. And one of those would be the succumbing to the temptations of authoritarianism, and the other would be succumbing to the temptations of nihilism. Because they're, they're logical consequences of the of the definition of subjective as non-real. So now then you ask yourself, well, how do you determine whether or not a theory is true? Then you ask yourself, well, what do you mean by true? Well, then you're in trouble. 
Okay, because I think you can take a Newtonian perspective on that or a Darwinian perspective. 